Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is taken out of our gospel lesson. I read again John 21, verse 5. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. In our gospel lesson, we have another post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. And it falls nicely into two parts. Part one is the account of a miraculous catch of fish. And part two is the account of Jesus restoring Peter as a shepherd in his flock, along with a little peek into how Peter was going to die. It's kind of hard to focus on the first part of the story when the second part has that wonderful charge to Peter to feed my sheep. And what pastor isn't anxious to talk about how he gets to do that? However, today we will focus on the first part and that miraculous catch. Peter, John, Andrew, Thomas, and many of the other disciples were fishermen by trade. So the story that we have recorded by John has a very natural feel to it. Jesus had ascended, uh, risen from the grave, but had not yet ascended into heaven, and therefore had not yet given the Great Commission. The men were together, but Jesus wasn't with them. He would no longer be walking the roads with them and teaching, drawing large crowds, healing people, and so forth. What had occupied their days for three years was now done, over. With nothing better to do, Peter decides to go fishing. Might as well earn a little bit of money plying his trade, and the others quickly decide to join him. They had cast their nets all night and caught nothing. With only futility as their reward for a long night, they headed back to shore at daybreak. There, in the morning light, stood Jesus, who asked if they had caught anything. The text tells us that the disciples did not recognize Jesus, at least not at first. Some believe there was a morning mist that obscured their view of the Lord. Others think that the daylight simply was not bright enough yet for anybody to recognize anybody. And, you know, maybe Jesus was there being silhouetted by the rising sun or something like that. Perhaps uh, the people who think that the identity of Jesus was being deliberately and divinely obscured like it was with the disciples on the road to Emmaus was, are correct. Whatever the reason, what we do know is that they did not immediately recognize Jesus when our Lord asked them if they had caught anything. They admitted that the night's work had been a waste of time. There was no fish in the boat. Then the mystery man issued a strange command. Cast your net out on the right side of the boat. What difference would it make which side of the boat they threw their net? They were also only about 100 yards off from the shore, out in the water, which is not a prime fishing spot for commercial fishing. I grew up in San Diego. And at that time, it was a major commercial fishing port. And you can trust me on this. The tuna trawlers went much further than 100 yards out into the ocean to catch the fish. So the disciples knew that this was not standard fishing practice. Still, the disciples complied. Why not? What did they have to lose, right? And what a surprise. The net was filled with 153 large fish. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter 
instantly realizes John is right. And so he jumps out of the boat, leaves his friends, and goes to meet Jesus. The story echoes an event that happened earlier in our Lord's ministry, in the early days, actually. In this event, Peter is fishing uh, with his associates again, and once again, they had labored all night and caught nothing. Jesus shows up, followed by a large crowd. Our Lord gets into Peter's boat, and they put out a few yards into the lake. Jesus sits in the boat and teaches the crowd. After his sermon, Jesus tells Peter and his fellow fishermen to put out into the deep and let out their nets. Peter and his fellow fishermen know that this would be an exercise in futility. It was a dumb fishing practice. Nonetheless, they followed Jesus' instruction. As our story in John 21, so also in our story in Luke 5, there is a miraculous catch of fish. The Luke 5 story also includes that very famous line now where Jesus tells people, Peter he would become a fisher of men. One of the big differences between the stories is Peter's reaction. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Peter says to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. At the end of his ministry as a man here on earth, Peter literally jumps at the chance to be with Jesus again. These two responses remind us of Adam and Eve in the garden. Before their fall into sin, Adam and Eve rejoiced in the presence of Jesus. After they sinned, that same divine Lord filled them with fear, and they hid from him. Just as Adam and Eve broke our loving relationship with God, so God in Jesus restores that loving relationship. So Adam and Eve went from rejoicing in seeing Jesus to fearing him, while Peter went from fearing the presence of Jesus to rejoicing in being in the presence of our Lord. The same is true for us and for all who receive faith in Jesus, who have received the forgiveness of sin he merited for us on Good Friday. Being in his presence is a source of true joy. In both stories, it is clear that the catch of fish was a miracle. Sure, the disciples cast the nets, and sure, they hauled the fish in, but the actual catch was orchestrated by Jesus. The technical skills of the disciples did not suddenly improve. They were not instantly better fishermen. They were no better than when they caught nothing. They were not responsible in any way, shape, or form for this catch any more than the invalid of 38 years in John 5 was responsible for his healing when he did what Jesus said and got up, carried his bed, and walked. In the New Testament, fishing is a metaphor for sharing the gospel. That is, of course, what is behind our Lord telling Jesus that he would become, I mean Peter, that he would become a fisher of men in Luke 5. With that in mind, we observe that the catch is due to the gracious action of the Lord and not due to the technical skills of the fishermen or our own skills. Sure, we cast the net, and sure, we haul the net in, but it is the Lord who grants success. Sometimes we can toil all night long doing everything right and not catch a thing. Other times, the catch is beyond our imagination. If you walk into a Christian bookstore, it is easy to find evangelism books and books about outreach in general. Now, I have no problem with such books, especially if they enable us to more clearly articulate 
the truths of God's word as we have them encapsulated in the creeds. However, we need to remember the lesson we learned from the disciples' fishing trips. No purely human outreach technique can guarantee success in catching men for Jesus. How many times has a Christian shared their faith, perhaps even you, only to have the person told the gospel turn a deaf ear to the message? It is hard not to take such things personally. It is hard not to ask oneself, what did I say wrong? What did I do wrong? And the simple fact is that you may well have done nothing wrong and said nothing wrong. You may have said and done everything perfectly correct. Jesus did not say or do anything wrong, yet Caiaphas never came to a saving faith. Why some fish swim into the net while others swim around it is something we will never know, at least on this side of glory. What we do is follow the example of Peter and the others in the boat. Jesus said, cast your nets, and they cast their nets. We are told in many places to do the same thing. So, for example, Peter once wrote, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. As it was for Peter and the other disciples that day, so it is for us. The catch is up to the Lord. Paul knew this also. That's why he once wrote, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. To put this in more conventional terms, we are saved by grace and not by ourselves. It is a gift of God not of works, so no one can boast. This is not only in reference to personal works and trying to save ourselves, but also in works to save others. We save no one. Jesus saves. It is hard to find a more startling example of that than St. Paul in our lesson from Acts this morning. He heard the gospel when he joined in condemning Stephen, the first martyr. Yet he swam around the net that day. Saul, who later changed his name to Paul, doesn't come to faith until Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. Stephen did nothing wrong in his witness. He said nothing wrong. The Lord's timing is simply different than ours many times. Stephen planted but it wasn't harvest time just yet. Returning to the fishing metaphor, we are called to cast the net. Jesus directs the fish. Now, fishing is a popular pastime. How many people here like to fish? Yeah, it's a popular pastime. And if you talk to those who enjoy this sport, they can regale you with countless stories extolling their skills, and describing catch after catch. Seldom do they like to talk about the times they came back from fishing and their stringer was empty. Seldom do they want to share the same report that the disciples did that day with Jesus. Children, have you caught anything? No. Fishermen are also always eager to learn where the best places are to fish, what is the best bait, what's the latest lure that the fish are really heading on, and on and on and on. And that is because they want to duplicate the techniques and thereby duplicate the results of getting a stringer full of fish. No one wants to copy a fisherman that is not catching fish. That's just the way it is. The same is true when it comes to catching people for Jesus. You can always hear stories about this or that event or this or that charismatic preacher who doesn't have to read all of his 
sermons all the time to make sure he gets them right. And people have seen a church turn around and you go, wow, that's what we want. And other churches, other people will flock to that church hoping to maybe duplicate the success that they've seen in that congregation. But all too often, the results are disappointing. How easy it is for us to forget that the catch is not up to us or our technical skill. It is the Lord's catch. We are called to cast the net. Yes, we are called to do it to the best of our abilities. Yes, we are supposed to cast that gospel net with gentleness and respect, all of it that we can muster. But in the end, only Jesus can cause the net to be filled. Only Jesus saves. As we cast our gospel net into our part of the sea, if our nets should remain empty, let us remember that it's God's gracious invitation to salvation people are ignoring and not think of it as a personal failure. On the other hand, if the Lord should bless us with a good catch, let us always remember that it is the Lord's results and not ours. There's no reason to believe that we are better fishermen than anyone else. Jesus once spoke of his Father as being the Lord of the harvest. We can change that metaphor up just a bit and say that God is also the Lord of the catch. That is worth remembering as we fish for Jesus. It will keep us from becoming overly dejected or proud about the Lord's results. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.